Am I on? Sweet. Okay, cool. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us here tonight. So I am so beyond thrilled um, to be up here with David Politis, the founder and executive chairman of Better Cloud. Um, this is, as John mentioned, this is a fireside chat, a long time coming, literally 10 years coming, actually. We met David at this very meetup, the New York Enterprise Tech Meetup. Um, in 2013, and we, we have proof, um, where it's not actually David, I have to say. It's not David, but it is a teammate. This is a Jonathan Laird tweet. This is your team, someone on your team, right, doing the demo in October 2013. We dug up this up through the archives. Um, and I think for all of you who have been on this crazy startup journey, you can really appreciate, you know, so much of what we say at Workbench when we talk about community, it's just being able to meet phenomenal people um, like like all of you here today, but especially David, right? And uh, what's really special is when we become friends, right? And we can watch and cheer each other on uh, through all the highs and lows. And it's just been um, such a really special part of, um, I know John and myself and uh, watching you grow Better Cloud and um, really be able to call you a friend. So. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. And uh, we actually have more photos to come, so don't worry. Um, but over the years, we've watched you build and scale Better Cloud to be the leading SaaS management platform today. You've raised hundreds of millions of dollars, hired, um, and also maybe along the way, um, let go of some people, uh, but we, which we'll talk about, but hundreds of people, thousands of IT teams as customers. Um, and we're so immensely proud of what you've built. Yeah, we'll fl flip through some quick. Oh, here, this is actually myself, David, and John in 2018. This is a throwback photo. We all look much younger, much happier. I have hair. Uh, keep going. This is like really deep, David, right here. Um, and the other part that we feel so, so grateful about with David is that he's always kept it super real with our Workbench community. So we've had you now for multiple founder dinners. Um, and I think that's really where um, our founder and community just so appreciate the transparency, you being so honest, um, again, about the highs and lows. And I think I speak for everyone when um, I say this has been a long freaking year um, and um, and I, I see some head nods um, and so that's why we really want to use tonight as almost like year-end therapy and just a chance for all founders to kind of breathe in and breathe out um, and what's special is that you have now written a document this is um, over I think it's over 100 pages um, and you've titled it 50 plus um, lessons that you've learned as a founder. So we're gonna pull some here tonight. We're not gonna get through all 50, uh, but uh, these are hard earned lessons from David uh, that may be helpful for you to think about through all the stages. Um, and then we'll have lots of time for Q&A. Does that sound good? Excellent. Awesome. Does this work? Yes, good. Yeah, so um, I guess just to kick off at Workbench here we- Before, before we do that, yeah. I just wanna tell everyone <laughs> quickly about the, those pictures. So it was literally 10 years ago, 10 years ago at that New York Enterprise Tech meetup. Um, I was, we were looking for customers. We were looking for any customers we could find. Um, and my team came to me and they said, we found this amazing event. It's called the New York Enterprise Tech meetup. And I think we can demo our product there. And I was so excited. I was so nervous. And we came to this New York Enterprise Tech Meetup at the Cooley offices. I think it was in a conference room. There were about approximately maybe 30, 20, 30 chairs set up. We showed up. We practiced our pitch. We practiced. We prepared a deck. We did all of this stuff. And we arrived there. And there's probably 12 people there. And we were three of the 12. Um, <laughs> I think there were some Cooley lawyers who were very confused about what was happening. <laughs> and it was like, that was exactly 10 years ago. And it is amazing to see what has happened with this event, what has happened with New York Enterprise technology in general. In general. Um, and I, I want to say before we get started, I, I would love to just say thank you to the Workbench team because for 10 years, 10 years to keep up this kind of event, takes a lot of dedication. I don't know who's put on an event for 10 years monthly. It is not 
I've not done that myself. Um, it is amazing. It is really amazing, and it's and it's a big reason why the community here has thrived, and it's been a centerpiece through all of all these years. There's been amazing, amazing speakers at the events and all of that. So I just want to say that because I, I I've been this is like a very much of a full circle moment for me, um, and and it's amazing just to see the people who are here and the companies that are represented here, and that this is even happening um, in New York City is is amazing. So. I wanted to give a standing ovation. Aww, thank you, Jamie. Everyone can get up yes. for John. Everyone Jess. who's a part of this with us, obviously. A community is only as good as, obviously, everyone a part of it. Thank you, David. And I know John's feeling very, very proud in the back. Um, I mean, the one other thing I'll just add, and, and we can this can be a good transition now, is how many people, you, like I said, who have been a part of the Better Cloud journey, who you've personally mentored. I know there's a whole Better Cloud mafia now, right, of people who have gone on to start companies. And again, I think it speaks to you, again, who you are as a person um, guiding and just uh, being such an incredible um, leader and friend to so many. So maybe that's a great transition into the topic today. So when we, uh, when Dave and I were prepping this, we looked at all the different areas that he wanted to talk about, right? So I broke it up into four, four categories. First was sales. And then second was actually um, around hiring. You have, you have a lot of thoughts about hiring. Um, the third was around investors. And then the fourth was around team. And then I realized I just spelled shit. And I was like, OK, we need to rebrand this. So I'm going to change it to um, sales, hiring, fundraising, and team to be more like shift. So founders dealing with shift. But maybe let's go back to the very, very early days, like you said, 20, 2013, 2012 right, um, and taking us back to that, that original photo. What was that time like when you think back on it now over 10 yeah. years? So, you know, we started end of 2011, early 2012. And, um, you know, that was uh, the picture that you see there is me in my father's office. It was the only office space we could get. Um, and, you know, we, we filled that space. That space had five people in it. Um, and which is crazy to even say that. Um, but, but it was a, you know, you don't really know, you're kind of naive to the journey um, that you're about to go on. And it was, I mean, the stuff that happened, you know, from that point to today, I couldn't have even imagined, honestly. Um, and good and bad, by the way. And, and so that, that I, I've tried to rewind to that moment in time as we were preparing for this to think about some of the things that I wish I knew back then. And, and since I've stepped down as CEO of Better Cloud into this chairman role, I've been spending a lot of time advising companies at exactly that stage. And it's been just, um, it's, it's really, um, there's some easy, I would say relatively easy things that can save you months, years, millions of dollars, literally millions of dollars, um, and, and get you really shorten the learning curve. And that, for me, is I feel like it's as much as I can give that back to, to this, this team, um, you know, to, to this community. Yeah. So let's start with sales. This wouldn't be the New York Enterprise Tech Meetup without sales first. Your first uh, word of advice, get direct selling down fast, first and fast. Um, there's a lot in that. <laughs> So I think, you know, I think when you're starting when you're starting out, and we're talking about very early, again, right at the beginning, you're trying to get that first set of customers. What I've seen is a couple of mistakes made. First of all, I see that people say, oh, we found this channel. It's great. They're so excited about what we're building. Our product's only like a week old, but the channel loves it, and they're going to sell this thing all over the place. I got Accenture to sell this. Real life, that's not going to happen, right? And by the way, I went through that. I said, no, 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 Accenture loves what we're building. They love this. They're trying to build a Google practice. They want better cloud to be in there. They don't care. They, 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 don't, they don't, you have to be so much bigger to make any kind of impact to their business, right? You also have to have enough people to basically live at their offices in order to have that kind of impact. Later on, that's possible. But early on, you have to own that process. You have to make sure you figure out what the messaging even is. What is the motion? Who is the ideal customer profile? You have to figure that out yourself because it is not easy. In the beginning, you're going to go down this path. Nope, it's not good to sell to schools. Let me go down this path. Nope, it's not good to sell to government. Okay, let me go down this path. And until you find that path, you really can't expect anyone else to sell the product. It's, it's impossible. Um, and so to me, I think a really important piece that I learned and spent, again, way too much time wasting cycles on is really in the beginning, figure out how you sell the product directly 
yourself, and by the way, I should also say yourself as a founder or co-founder before you go hire people. I've talked to a couple founders who are on their second, third company, and they figure, you know what, I'm just gonna go hire salespeople right out of the gate because it's much easier. I already know what I'm doing. The reality is you, you still need to learn that motion and prove it yourself as a founder before you go hire that next person to go, to go sell for you. When did you hire your first AE or sales rep? We, we didn't hire our first AE till we were probably at a million of ARR. So we, we got to about a million of ARR before we hired our first AE. And we, you know, I was doing the selling, the CTO was doing the, the kind of co-founder CTO was doing the selling. I mean, it was everyone, um, but not an AE. And, and even when we got the AEs on board, I did probably the next million and a half to two million, me and then someone else who was on the team who had been there from the beginning. And so I think it's just really important to get figure that out and, and not trick yourself into saying, well, I'm just going to get a BDR and a salesperson and it's just magically going to work because in the early stages, you have, to, you have to build that motion. You have to understand that value prop and figure that out. Yeah. Or, or a VP of sales, right? I mean, some, often we, we at Workbench, we work with many technical founders, and I think there's this allergic reaction sometimes to sales, and they'll, you know, sometimes when we founders say, oh, well, I'll just hire a VP of sales. It's like until you know that messaging down to a T yourself, and just every conversation you have is a rep, right? It's a rep to get it more and more honed. I guess any other pro tips on honing your messaging? When did you feel like, okay, this is really good enough for me to scale up a team? Um, I think that for us, it was, you can feel it. I don't, I actually feel this with selling and also fundraising actually, where you, when you start doing those reps each time you're kind of picking up, Oh, that's when their eyes light up. Oh, okay. That's when their body length, you know, you can start kind of feeling those moments in time and you start to lean into that, remove some of the other stuff. And as you do that, you get kind of better and better. I don't, I, for me, it's more like a feeling that you get where you're like, wow, these sales are going to happen much faster, yeah. you know? And, yeah. and I think that was, um, um, that's a hard, it's a hard period of time to get through. And it's a very scary period when you're trying to figure it out, but outsourcing it, I guess is my point. Outsourcing it is not, that, that's not going to solve the problem, I guess is the summary. Yeah. And we'll, we'll come back to sales. There's a lot more on sales, I guess. Um, your pro tip though is to turn, let's say that first five, seven, 10 customers, once you can really get them right, into raving fans. So maybe talk a little bit some about the things you did to do that. That for me, that maybe is maybe one of the most important tips and something that I've given to other founders that I know has worked for them, which is that first set of customers. And I'm talking about first five, 10. In our case, we had a product, our first product, we called it Flash Panel, and we called it the Flash Panel 50. And it was the first 50 customers on our platform. We literally went overboard. And when I say <laughs> overboard, we're a tiny company with almost no funding. We recorded individualized videos, the entire team recorded individualized videos for every one of those first 50 customers, thanking them for installing our product, for using the product. I'm doing like the entire team, the engineers, everyone, we we're like, thank you, Rick. You really helped, you know, and we did that. We sent them handwritten notes. We sent them t-shirts, said beta tester on the back. We told them you are part of this 50 customers and we, we met with them I think for six months, we met with them every single month for an hour, one-on-one. -on -one. Just think, like, that's a lot of energy. But those customers still to this day, many of them are still paying customers, number one. Number two, when we did our rounds of financing and someone would say to us, hey, can we get a list of customers, some references? We would just turn over a list of 25, 30 companies. Can you imagine for a Series A, you're handing over a list of 25 accounts saying, call whoever you want. Call whoever you want. And we knew that these people, we didn't, what I see some founders do is in those early customers, you want to try to pretend, by the way, I did the same thing. In the beginning, you're like, let me try to pretend to be bigger than I am because why is this customer going to want to work with this tiny company? In reality, when you're actually open about it, a lot of these customers, they appreciate that and they want to be on that journey with you because that's, they get to influence the entire, you know, some of our customers literally on a piece of paper drew for us certain features that we ended up building, who's gonna do that for them? And so there's an opportunity early on to create those relationships and have that type of um, partner, really true partnership with those early customers. And if it wasn't for our early customers, I mean, we would never be 
where we are. And, and by the way, I learned this tactic from Marketo. I was Marketo's second customer ever. And what they did for me and, and helped me handhold me through their product and talking to the CEO and the founders, I was their, their seed investor reference call. Like those things stuck with me. They sent me the t-shirt, the handwritten note, all of those things stuck with me. And I, I tried to replicate that. And that is, I think, so important because those customers help you in ways you can't even imagine. References for investors, video testimonials, your first case studies, your first paying customers, all of that. Yeah, and I, I, th I, I would love to underline, right, again, I think all of us are so, of course, thinking about how do I get my first five, my first 10, my first 20, but there's so much thing to be said about nurturing that first five, right, and the handwritten note, right, like, these small things go a long way. You had mentioned also sweatshirts, like, they seem to, like, you had made, like, very special sweatshirts for them, and they would rock it. Um, and then, th I might be jumping the script a little, but you did eventually then later on do an annual survey with customers, which I thought was a really interesting point, right? We do so many surveys internally with our teams, but I'd love if you talk about this survey you did with customers. Definitely. Definitely. So from an early stage in the business, what we did, and by the way, some of these surveys didn't result in the best things, but I'll, what we did is every single year annually, we did a survey to our entire customer base and actually our entire community. So it wasn't just the customers, the paying customers, but it was also the community of, uh, we had a, a community of IT professionals. Anyway, we, we surveyed everyone annually. And we would ask them things about what's happening in, this, in the industry, what do they want to see in our product, what problems do they have in their jobs, all of those kinds of things, which were really, really powerful. The, the first survey we did, which is where I made my mistake, is we actually went, our, we went to all of our customers, and that time it was a beta product, so they're free customers, and we asked them, I thought this was brilliant at the time, how much would you like to pay for the product? <laughs> and so we asked all these customers, and then we said, we're going to ask some set, will you pay $2, $4, whatever? And the, the, the peak was kind of at $10 a user a year a user a year, just to take that into account. And we did that, that was our first price. So sometimes we kind of took it too literally, but that survey provided so much clarity for what we were working on, why we were working on it. It created content for us. We, we were putting out content in the early days when Google Workspace or Google, Google Apps at the time, Microsoft 365, we were putting out content that was literally benchmarking those two things, like those two platforms against each other. And no one had that data. And we had that because we had thousands of IT professionals answering these surveys and telling us how they're using those platforms. And so that was, those, those surveys, they took a lot of work every year. And then by the end, people were fighting to get questions in the surveys so that they could then make arguments for getting budget for certain projects and initiatives and things like that. I, those surveys, I think it's, it's amazing what you find when you do that and what someone will tell you. Yeah. We actually started writing the email from me in a very sincere way of like, I will read every single response. And the last question said, if you were the CEO of BetterCloud, what would you do? Mm. Amazing amazing what kind I mean the customers knew actually what what we should be building what we should be doing yeah and that's actually I think a great transition um, uh, segue into product right because I do think in the early days there's almost so much to build right there's this roadmap and it's actually so hard to prioritize and you talk to one set of customers they want this and another set of customers they want that right and so you had said in your in your amazing book slash doc is you know to build one thing be great at it and then expand um, and the other point was that a lot of features are not actually used by customers. I think that's actually a great reminder to folks. But maybe talk a little bit about that um, just for folks who are in the earliest stages of building. I, I think that what happens in the early stages is you're, you're, oh, you are looking for customers. and You're trying to find any which way to bring on customers, paying customers, free customers, whatever it is, design partners. And the challenge is you, you really... Uh, again, I'm speaking from experience, you start to lose focus very quickly and you start to try to move, the way I described it to my team is you're moving you know, five boulders up the hill at one time with a company that's only big enough to move like one little rock up the hill, you know, but you're trying to move five up, to, up the hill at the same time. And that, that is a really, really challenging thing to do. And you, you're doing it for good reason because you're like, oh, that customer said that. Then the next day you're like, that customer said that in that meeting. And you, you, you start to kind of follow those individual things. And I think finding that niche and saying like this is where as as one of my investors told me like the fast moving water is like find that fast moving water and just go and just go until you 
really can't go any longer. And by the way, it's probably longer than you think you can, you can make it with that product. Of course, you have to be solving a real problem. But you trying to become, you know, I've, I see people tell me like, I'm going to build this platform and I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to displace XYZ company that's, you know, two billion of revenue. It's like, OK, maybe we should start with one thing and really nail that. Get the customers on board. You can afford to do it at a lower price in 99% in of the cases. You can afford to be much more flexible and, and iterate faster in 99% of the cases. And so I think finding that area of the fast moving water and just going there and staying that path until you just, you win. You own that path, you're winning deals, it's very clear, and then you can start evolving from there. Yeah, and I will say, I think what's hard is sometimes it's not clear if you are doing the right thing, right? It's like, okay, I think I think it's going well, but maybe if I go here, this will be even better, right? So I, I definitely can empathize, I think, with founders who are just at the early stages trying to experiment. Um, and you talk a little bit about this more for your team, right, which is the power of a single goal, right? Um, when you're early, it's powerful to give the company a single goal. So maybe talk about that. Was that like a, a revenue goal? Was that a number of customers goal? Great. So the, the single goal thing, that for me, as I've kind of come up in technology 20 years working in different technology companies, you hear about OKRs and you hear about this and you see people doing, implementing, we have this whole system. And But when you're small, and again, I'm talking about very early stage, you cannot support that kind of a system. It just it doesn't even make sense. Um, and what I saw in the early days of Better Cloud, one very real example is we said to the whole company, it was probably 15 people at the time, we said, we want to become the number one application on the Google Apps marketplace, which you can think of as like the Salesforce App Exchange, for example. And so we said, we want to be the number one application. And we became obsessed. And I'm saying engineering, marketing, me, everyone. We said, if we get to the number one spot, that's going to drive installs through the roof, so on and so forth. So we focused everyone's energy. And why that mattered is because everyone knew, okay, that's this is, again, really early on, but it was how do we get there with the product? What features do we have to build that are going to get us those installs? Marketing had an intern who monitored the marketplace every hour on the hour for five days through the night and actually checked how many installs people had, how many reviews, what rank were they, so that we could figure it out. Anyway, we did all of that, and we worked on that for months and months and months. And then we said, okay, today's the day. And everyone was building up to that day. We did it. When we got when we, we got up to number one in the marketplace, it was amazing. It was like, you know, everyone celebrated. Then after that, we said, okay, what's the next goal? And the next goal was to get a million users and users on the platform. And we put up a sticker, like a thermometer sticker, and we just every day with a little pen just like filled it in as we got more and more users. And every day that was all that everyone was focused on. And I think in this early stage, it's important, right? You have companies that say, we have to get to a million of ARR, otherwise we can't raise our next round. There really shouldn't be any other goals. The goal is a million of ARR, and every engineer should understand when I do this, that's going to help increase revenue. Every marketing person, when I do this, that's going to help increase revenue. Because really at the early stage, there's such critical kind of moments and milestones. It could be get five customers. It could be, but I think when you're small, aligning everyone around one thing, measuring that, celebrating that. Like, it's amazing the kind of momentum you build when you start doing that. Yeah, and again, I think this thermometer kind of image I have in my head just underscores that you can also have fun with it, right? And these are big goals and people are busting their ass on it, but I think what I've heard from you over the years is like, how do you bring that human element? And yeah, it's a million error, but could we do things that just make people really want like like really enjoy doing it, right? Um, one of the things we can talk about this later is you know you and the company really created these values, right? But that is we all have seen the list of values, right? It's like ten values, et cetera. But then you actually had your designer create it and make it look like graphics, right? And make it look like really pop and that people could really remember that, right? And and one of our other founders talks a lot about it too. It's like so much of what you do as a, as a CEO, you're, you're pitching to customers, you're pitching to investors, but you also have to pitch your own team, right? And so what she does is she once at the very start of the year comes up with a tagline and it's a very short tagline. So like in 2022, she had this concept, double up, double down. She was talking about like revenue and doubling down on product. But you could just see how in every team meeting, she'd be like, Double up, double down, right? Over and over again until everyone in her company can remember it. So that internal marketing, I think, is so important. And even at 15, you'd be surprised, I think, at 15 people, right, the, the things you think is very obvious to everyone, and then it just 
obviously, you know, becomes even more challenging as you scale. Yeah, I think I think that in for me, one of the things I learned is how often, you know, I had to repeat myself in these kinds of things. Like, hey, our goal is this. Okay. Next day our goal is this. An email would go out. Then a Slack message would go out. Then we'd have an all hands meeting. Then another email would go out. Then another. You. It's really amazing how that repetition, yeah. how important that repetition is. And to your point, for internal marketing. Yeah. And you might think, oh my gosh, I've repeated this so many times, <laughs> but like honestly, yeah. you could probably do it more. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a big and but making it marketing like yes. I think about the values which we can talk about later. But even our all hands meetings, it was actually at one of these events. I can't remember who it was who said it. They said we produce our all hands meetings. Like it is not a just show up and the CEO talks. Like we produce them, and yeah. that was a big like click for me of like, okay, we're going to create a deck. We're going to have sections. We're going to have people coming in and speaking. We're going to give out awards. We're going to, and it's amazing how much more powerful that is yeah. when you do that. Yeah. And so on team, right? Again, this is where you've, t you talk a lot about this and I so appreciate this. I think this is honestly one of the, the core jobs of, uh, of a CEO is hiring, right? And recruiting teams. And then of course, you know, uh, making sure there's enough money in the bank, which we'll get to. But um, you talk about when hiring executives hire for the right stage. So maybe talk a little bit about that. So um, I'll give you a story to illustrate this. I, I, I think it's easier. So we're early stage. We're pre-rev. We're, we're a million of ARR, let's call it a million, two million. And I say, it's time for me now, because I've fill, figured out this repeatable motion. It's time for me to hire a VP of sales or a CRO. So I go out looking and I say, you know what I need? We're sell to IT. I need someone who comes from Dell and Cisco and Microsoft and this and that. And I'm like, that's, that's going to be the person. That is going to be the person. And so I get a recruiter, a search firm. We pay them way too much money. They go out. <laughs> they do the search. They're pitching the job. They're pitching the company. This is going to be a huge company. Two million of ARR at the time. And we get this head of sales. Good guy. But we get this head of sales who has all of those experiences that I just mentioned. His team, I think he was managing a $500 million book of business. I think at one company, a billion at another company. He had sales reps, sales operations, SCs. He had every, I don't know, two EAs. He had everything. And I said, but this is the, he understands this customer. He understands, he's done this at scale. And so, and he, by the way, also was like, this is great. I'm going to get a lot of equity. I'm going to make millions of dollars. And so we agreed and he joined the company. It was the, literally, it was the, it was, I'm just being honest. It was, it was the worst. And, <laughs> and by the way, I've had that experience over and over and over again, where every time like, no, no, what I need is the person who was at that big company, who has the brand name and all of that. And what you learn very quickly, actually, is that if someone works, and by the way, I, I've never had the experience or the luck of working at a Google or Microsoft or Amazon or any of those companies, just to be clear. But if you work at one of those companies, right, you're emailing someone from at Microsoft.com, they will respond to you because Microsoft's one of the best companies in the world. You write from at Google.com, they will respond to you because they want to understand what you're working on with this technology or whatever. But when you write to them from at BetterCloud.com, no one gives a shit. Okay, and that is the challenge that we faced where it's a very different motion when you're having to create a brand, get your foot in the door, you know, have no team, by the way, you're doing all the calls yourselves, you're doing, and so that was a lesson for me, you know, and I'm not saying 100% of the time, there are probably people who are, you know, um, the outliers to that rule, of course there are, but generally speaking, when you think like, oh, that's the, that's the industry, that's the company that does it the best, that's the, it's different to work at a company that's two million of ARR. It's different to work at a company that's $5 million. I don't care what anyone says. It is different. It is different from a comp perspective. It is different from a lead flow perspective. It is different from a product perspective. It is just extremely, extremely different. And so I think especially early, you want to hire people that are stage appropriate for your business who want to do that. Like they're ready for that grind, which is, which is just a different and risk and everything. Yeah, I, I know Brian's floating around here somewhere. He, he talks a lot about the concept of vintage, right? So it's less about, okay, were they at Microsoft? Maybe they were Microsoft. Maybe they're the second person at Microsoft, 
That's right? The then that could be great, right? But if, you know, Microsoft at two versus two billion is very different, right? Um, awesome. I also just want to, I know in the intro I kind of said, oh, you've hired lots of people. You've also let go of people. And I, I just, I call that out because you're so open about that. And to be honest, I think for anyone who's had to let go of people, transition people out, it's just really shitty, right? And it's, but it is part, a huge part of the founder's job, right? Um, in your book, you mentioned actually letting someone go, feeling really terrible about it, and then you, you ran into them. Do you want to talk about that? So, I mean, look, letting someone go, if you haven't done it, um, it is, uh, it's a very emotionally um, painful thing to go through. I mean, I remember the first person I had to let go, I, I didn't sleep, I think, for two days before I let them go because I was that nervous about it. Um, and, you know, then what happened as I went further and further in my career is I started having this understanding and this one particular moment really clicked for me is I had this understanding that actually when you're at that place where you realize someone's not going to make it, it's probably better for them and for you to make that decision, right? And that's hard to actually see in the moment. But I had a person, a salesperson, he was, I loved this guy. And he was, he was an amazing, he had all the energy, he had everything. And we had, this is not Better Cloud, this is a previous company. And he had, we did inside sales, all inside sales over the phone. And he had come from an outside sales background, had been trained amazing, like really the guy was, was great. But over the phone and over email, he was not very good for a whole host of reasons. He just didn't have the same energy. His emails weren't that eloquent. Like it was, it was a tough, it was a, he wasn't having a great success being an inside salesperson. And so it was very hard because we liked him so much, we let him go. And I will never forget this ever. We let him go. And I don't remember exactly how long, but I think it was about, he was crying. I was crying. It was like, you know, a whole thing. Six months later, I ran into him at a bar. This is when the company was in Atlanta. I ran into a bar in Atlanta, and he came up to me, and he gave me a huge hug. And he said, thank you so much for letting me go. I was like, uh, you know, <laughs> what happened? And he said, I got a job in outside sales at a chemicals company, chemicals company. We were selling cloud PBXs. So he went from that to a chemicals company, and he was making something like three or four times how much he was making because he just crushed it at outside sales. Like that's where he belonged and it wasn't really a good fit. And I have so many of those stories where you say in this particular environment for this particular company, for this particular motion, it's not a good fit. That doesn't mean they're not capable. It just means in that exact environment, they're not capable. And that for me was a really big lesson where I almost feel like when I get there, it's just, it's actually better. Really, it is because everyone wants to grow in their career. Everyone wants to have opportunities. And if they're not going to have those, then, you know, now, of course, you want to do it in the right way. And, you know, what I really got to at the end, at, especially at that first company, was we just got to a point where everything was so clear in terms of expectations that people knew if they weren't hitting those expectations. Right. And it wasn't yeah. even a process. It was totally. just like, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think this is a good transition actually to what I call mid-stage, right? And so we still have some photo photos up here. So this is a hundred. What was this? A hundred employees? Uh, so this 100 is- hundred customers? Speaking of, uh, speaking of goals. So this is, we, we uh, I'll give you the story quickly. So what we, we're talking about having fun. We, um, we, we decided at some point, this is, so just to give some background, we built a product that essentially was a better admin console for Google Apps. That's the best, or what is now Google Workspace. That was how we started the business. What happened in 2016, 15, 16, people started coming to us saying, I'm using Microsoft 365. I'm using Zoom. I'm using Slack. I'm using this. Can you take what you do and build a control plane across my SaaS applications? We made a huge bet. $25 million or so to rebuild our entire platform to be able to do exactly what I just said, become a real SaaS management platform. We launched that platform in early 2017, call it January 2017. We were going to run out of money, call it sometime in 2018, you know, and when we went out to talk to investors, I said, I got this cool new product. It's amazing. It's going to be awesome. It's going to change the game. And the investor said, how many customers are on it? I said, zero. I said, well, you got to get some critical mass on that platform before we see anything that we can invest behind. At this time, we're doing about 5 million of ARR. And so basically, 
what we did is I talked to all these investors and I kept hearing from people, you need critical mass, critical mass. Anyway, long story short, I got to the point where 100 customers on the new platform was what they considered critical mass. And so talking about a single goal, we set a goal for the company. We need 100 customers on this platform by the end of September of 2017. The only thing on every monitor in every, everyone was in the office at that time, the only thing on the monitors was a counter up to 100. Nice. And that's all we did. We changed pricing on a whim because it was too complicated. We, we redid our messaging. We did this. We did this campaign. We prom promoted these features before these other features. Anyway, we got to 100. By the way, we, didn't get, we got to like 20 by like May, right? And we're trying to get to 100 by September. We're at like 20 in May, 30 in August. And we crushed the goal. At the end, we got to like 120 something. Yeah. And what we did is the next morning when people came in, we had 100 balloons. We had 100 on the balloons. We had 100 bottles of champagne. Wow. We had T-shirts that had the name of the, the, we gave it a project name. Anyway, we did all of that. And people to this day yeah. who are at Better Cloud or who have left Better Cloud, if you ask them what is the number one thing you remember, oh they remember gosh. that moment yeah. because that was a tipping point that allowed us to go from, you know, our ASP at the time was $5,000 a year. $5,000 a year ASP for a customer, as the average on the new platform was 15,000. So we tripled ASP on a critical mass of customers, which people then started to understand, okay, that's a, like, we can see where that goes. Yeah, that's incredible. Maybe, maybe flip through just one or two more. This looks like a, is this a mid-stage thing or is this a late-stage thing? This is like a late-stage thing. This is later stage. All right, we'll, we'll go back to the 100, stage. sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's stay here at the mid-stage, right? You have, you tripled your ASP. You got the whole team around this. I mean, can you just talk through that time period? And again, when you think back to it, what, do you, what comes to mind? So I have two sides of the memory. I have one, which is 2000, September 2015 was when we made the decision to rebuild the platform. At the time, September 2015, I was told by my engineering team that it's gonna take a year to rebuild. Um, so that's September of 2017. We launched in January of 15. We launched in January of 2017. So that's like 16, 17 months that it took to kind of get the product out the door. Um, that period of time, the, the 15 months, let's say, of 2016 essentially was the worst like year of my life yeah. that year was because we were just we we were just building we were just building and building no new capabilities coming out in the product um we lost every single um quota carrying person uh. except for one <laughs> One person stayed because everyone else like, I don't believe in the vision. You're never going to deliver it. You're never going to this. You're never going to that. Everyone quit. Everyone quit. We had one quota carrying person left. The product was taking a lot longer to deliver. The APIs of the platforms we were integrate weren't, weren't working. It was like, it was crazy. And so that period of 2016 was literally, that was the worst period of my career, frankly. And then 2017 was tough in the beginning but when we hit that number, when I knew we were going to hit that number, and when we hit it, it was vindication on investors who told me we weren't going to do it, customers who told me we weren't going to do Hell it, yeah. employees who told me we weren't going to do it. Yep. And then that was really, again, it's this, it was a turning point for the business because I, I think our, you know, ceiling probably would have been 10 million of ARR with the old product, whereas the ceiling on this one is already proving to be hundreds of millions. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I'm guessing for some folks, right, 2023 might be their 2016, right? Where you're just like, oh, everything's just so hard. Um, I believe in what we're doing, but we have to, there's a lot we have to prove out, right? Um, and so can you maybe talk through just how you really, you know, had that fortitude and I guess that conviction in yourself, in this vision, in this huge bet that you made, right? To basically scrap the old product, go all in on your new product, was there were there data points that, that said, "Hey, you got to do this," um, or you know, uh, this it is was, there's a bigger picture for you. It was a really hard. It was to make the decision to do it was difficult. Yeah. To make the decision to stay with it was definitely more difficult. Right. I think our conviction came from, and a lot of my stories will 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 point back to this. Our conviction came from um, our customers. We spend so much time 
uh, showing the product that we were going to build to our customers. We had a customer summit. Many people have customer summits. We had a customer summit. It was only about 40 customers here in New York. And we actually showed them what we were planning to build. We, we hijacked the entire thing. They thought it was going to be like a normal summit. We were like, hey, we're, we're telling you a secret. We want to build this thing. We showed them wireframes. We did all kinds of meetings. And at the end of a two-day summit with the customers, we asked them on a scale of 1 to 10, yeah. how much of an impact would this have on your job? And it was a 9.1 mm. on a scale of 1 to 10, 40 customers. And I knew at that moment, I knew that this is the thing we have to build. It was extremely hard. There is not really like a trick to get through. It's probably where I lost most of my hair was that period of time. <laughs> it was probably, you know, like that window was a very, very challenging moment. Yeah. But I had the conviction because I knew, I mean, I knew. I was talking to customers and they were telling me, we need this. Yeah. And we'll pay any amount for this. And when we started seeing, I, I just, I knew that that was it. My challenge was I'm not, I, it was just always more, took longer, more money, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. And, um, and that was challenging. I think knowing what I know today, Knowing what I know today, I would have proactively reduced our expenses on go to market that was having not nothing new to sell, nothing new to. Yeah. I probably would have proactively done that, yeah. knowing if I knew how, what I knew today, and then started ramping back up. You know, versus letting it just a trip. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, that's and I know you know this is uh, you know I, maybe some folks here are seeing this too. There are folks who are saying, look, the market's really tough. Um, if I need to go into cockroach mode on sales and marketing, let me do that, and then let me invest in the product. Now, that is obviously, like I said, a very big bet because you're you know betting that there is an upswing and that there is an other side. And you talked about this, right? You went to investors and they were just like, you don't have the proof points yet. So um, I guess maybe talk about that. It, it, it sounds like you're like, look. I know I can get there. I know I can get to 100. Um, but you, you had to time it correctly because, again, one of your other key points is, um, this, and this is bolded and it's like number 37 or something, but it says, um, don't run out of money, don't run out of money, don't run out of money, uh, which I, I think uh, cannot be understated or overstated enough. So maybe talk about how you balance, again, you're going all in, you don't quite have investor confidence yet. How did you make sure there was enough money in the bank? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we the the thing that we um, earlier in my career when I talk about that first company, the the cloud PBX business, we actually had a moment in time where we saw an opportunity to build. Um, we were actually before Ring Central as an example in, in in our space, and we saw an opportunity to do what Ring Central has now done and turn themselves into a full platform. And we were too scared to make that call because to make that call, we would have had to press the big red button and just rebuild. And we were too scared to do that at the time. Turned out to be that company got to 80 million or so of ARR, but Ring Central's at a, over a billion, right? So we, we had that moment and we didn't take that moment. And I think for me, I realized like, if we don't take this bet, like I, I what, you know, we we're going for something big here. We had made the decision at that point to swing for the fences and that yeah. was our swinging for the fences. But we were very aware of, to my point of don't run out of money, I was thinking about that all the time. And we knew that we had enough runway that if we didn't, that's why we didn't make the date end of the year and we made the date end of September. Because if we didn't hit that some number, buffer. <laughs> we had some buffer yeah. to then get us through at least another 18 months with okay. some changes. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, you have this point here, which is it's better to have flexibility and money in the bank rather than in a corner uh, to be, you know, in a corner hoping to execute perfectly and get funding at the optimal moment. Again, I know fundraising is so top of mind for so many people. Anything else that you'd kind of comment on there? I think that a lot of people, what I've seen, and maybe it's not the case anymore, and, and um, but I see, I, I believe that people, a lot of founders are trying to optimize for dilution, minimal dilution and valuation, you know? And um, I think that that is a, that's dangerous to do. Yeah. Um, and I find that I, you tell me, you, you've seen a lot more companies than I have. I feel like the outcome is kind of binary. And so really starting to optimize for, mail. I can get 3% better terms here and I can do this. At the end of the day, it's kind of binary. What's that really going to make the difference to the, to the outcome? And so as long as it's not crazy and you're not you know, selling 51% of the company right. in the Series A, right. like I think that optimizing for valuation and trying to minimize dilution is just, it's, it's a dangerous game to play. 
versus saying, look, I have money in the bank and I can be heads down for years, right? For me, the biggest thing is when we raised that first real round, you know, about $10 million, we, we were able to go to the team and say, we're heads down for three years. Do you know the, the amount of clarity you can have on plans when you're looking three years yep, out exactly. is very different than when you're looking 12 months out constantly. And, and so, you know, to me, I say optimize to get the money in the door, have the runway. As long as they're clean terms, don't worry about the valuation. Get the money in the door, have the runway. And that's where you should focus your energy and get the right partner that's more right. than anything else. We yeah. took a round where we actually brought on a partner that was at a lower value because they brought so much more to the table. That's than right. The other investor was giving us higher valuation. And yeah. that turned out to be the right decision. Yeah, I mean, we, we are, of course, biased at WorkBench. You know, we are seed investors, right? And uh, there are, we've met many founders who, especially at seed, you know, I think are very dilution sensitive. And we do find that it tends to be repeat founders who really get that, hey, look, this is a long journey. Those 1% to 2% basis points, like right now you're kind of trying to get very little dilution out of what is quite frankly nothing yet. Like, you know, it's see, like we're trying to make this big, but like, you know, there's there's it's almost like grabbing at, um, you know, uh, something that needs to still grow a lot. So, um, I, I mean, we're we very much are. Hey, if you can find uh, an investor who can really add value and like true and like we have to double click on what adding value is. Right. Um, but who can really make a big um, difference in your trajectory then uh, to optimize for that versus one or two, you know. Um, points maybe on, on, on post-money valuation. Um, okay, I want to end, um, I, I still have a lot to talk about, but I know lots of folks have questions too. Uh, so I will end actually on this point, um, which is to be transparent about what's hard. Right. Your team can help you. I thought that when I read that in your piece, I thought that was um, this ties a lot to 2016, 2017, where as founders, we feel like we have to solve all the problems. Right. And all of it is resting on our shoulders. And you had this really beautiful moment with your exec team where they're like, David, like we can help you. Yeah. So I think in general, again, from from early in my career, I was I was a CEO kind of battlefield promotion at the age of 22 in a basically failing company. Um, and when I took over there, I thought that I shouldn't be sharing the challenges with the team, because if I do, they may get scared and they may all quit. That's literally what I thought. I said, if I tell people the reality of what's happening in this business, everyone's going to quit. And um, then one day, um, we, you know, after 2008 happened, 30 something percent of our revenue was mortgage brokers and real estate brokers. And we lost all of that revenue in a month and we had to fire, um, half the company and it was very painful, but everyone was completely surprised that that had happened. And I realized at that moment, you have to share the burden because it's important for everyone to really understand how the business is doing and where they can make an impact and where you need the help. And then as we got to this 2016 situation at Better Cloud, if you ask people who were in that meeting, we had an all hands meeting where I actually showed up with a deck that I presented, that I put together. And I said, we just came out of a board meeting and it was like this. And it was a person getting a root canal. And I said, that is what that board meeting was like. And let me tell you all the reasons why. And we have to turn the tide and we have to and hear all the problems and when we had that ELT meeting people a bunch of people said Dave you have to like we need to know that this is happening so that we can jump in and help because by the way I went through this at my last company and I know what they did was this or I can introduce you to this person and so I think being transparent with the ELT but also with the company as a whole if you do that from day one people actually it's, it's like a mature, th you know, you want a mature team that can handle that yeah. and who wants to say, look, we want to be part of that. We want to be part of fixing this problem. We want to be part of turning this around. We want to be part of like these, these important critical moments, yeah. you know. To not be scared to let them know the truth, right? Because they'll hopefully rise to the occasion exactly right. and be able to want out, to help. You yeah. find out that some people... Like, that's where they actually thrive. Yeah, that's right. You know? That's right. Yeah, okay. We'll have Priyanka flip through these, and then Priyanka, thanks for standing up here. But I, I thought these are just such beautiful memories that you put together earlier this year, right? And I thought, how do you even put together 10 photos on LinkedIn from 10 years of Better Cloud, right? So this looks like... This, this is, is this is at Red Rocks 
in uh, in Colorado where we decided to do our company kickoff. Um, so every couple of years, we brought everyone together for a company kickoff, a summit, and we did it in Colorado and Denver. And what we did is we, we, we the person organizing it, she said, Dave, what kind of venue do you want? I said, let's get the coolest venue that we can find. She said, well, there's Red Rocks. I've never been to Red Rocks. She said, it's amazing. I said, well, it's probably very expensive. She said, no, it's wintertime. No one wants to go there. I said, yes, I said, okay. that is the hack. That's the we, trick. I think we paid two thousand dollars to rent <laughs> to rent the stage of Red Rocks. I mean, and we did our annual uh, company. We did the Better Clatter of the Year awards, and ten people at the company each year won these awards, and we presented it on wow. the stage of Red Rocks. That's amazing. Okay. Oh my gosh, this photo just gives me the chills to think of. Again, all the people you've touched along the way who have been a part of the Better Cloud journey. This is, this is in COVID. So this is when we, this is March of 2020 when everyone had to go work from home. We were a full in-office culture and everyone was in every day, five days a week in New York, Atlanta, and San Francisco. And then we went, we went remote, obviously, like everyone else did. And what you see here is everyone is wearing a T-shirt that we sent out. It's a black T-shirt with the Better Cloud logo in the middle. And on the arm, it says 2020. And what I told the company at this time, which I which still sticks with me is like, this is the group that is going to get through this period together. And we made exactly the number of t-shirts for the number of better clouders and said, if you're here at this time, you're going to remember that you were here at this time. And so everyone wore it for an all hands. That's amazing. Yes, we should clap. <laughs> And where is this, David? This is the last. This is the last summit that we did. The last company summit we did this in San Diego. This is in um, early 21. So this is basically, you know, right as COVID. You know, it's still kind of happening, but um, the variants were happening. But we brought as many people as we could together in San Diego, and it was a moment for me that I remember because I I got on stage here, and I can give you more background. But I I actually when I started Better Cloud, I hated speaking publicly, hated it, like literally hated it. And this was a moment that I was actually really looking forward to of getting in front of the team again in person. And it was the last time that the whole company, the whole, like the whole company, well, it was the first time since COVID and really the last time that the whole company has been together. Mm, amazing. This is cool. This is a group of better clouders <laughs> who got together and created a band. What? And they sang Journeys Don't Stop Believing." And it was amazing. It was literally so. This is in San Diego. This band got together. They were practicing virtually over Zoom. Oh my god! And then came together, and it was a full band. And it was it was it was amazing. So epic! All right, I love this photo. I mean, it's so much of being a founder. Like it's obviously a professional journey, but it's a personal journey, right? And your boys really grew up. Yeah. Knowing you as a better cloud, you know. So we CEO. started, when I started the company, I wasn't engaged, married, or had kids. And so in that period of time, not only did we grow Better Cloud, but I got married and we had two, two boys and, um, and they've really been a part of it. I have this photo every year, basically, for 10 years, 11 years. So I have them as they were growing up every year um, and, and they would come to the office. By the, by the end, you know, they were sitting in meetings, taking notes, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah. yeah. And awesome. awesome, thank, thank you, Priyanka. Priyanka. Um, amazing, amazing, amazing. I mean, what an incredible journey. I will have you end on this last note and then I will open up to questions, but um, I just think this is so important for every single person here to, to hear, which is to, don't be fooled by how perfect other companies look. So I think that this is this is maybe the lesson that I have learned the most over all these years is I feel like it's like living the Instagram life, you know, like everyone is just like it looks like everyone's life is perfect. They have the best, you know, jobs, marriages, trips, houses, I don't know, you know, all of that stuff, right? And and it's the same thing when it when you look at companies, right? You look at someone's LinkedIn post, you're like they are crushing it, you know. And like you hear, you see a press release. We grew so much that we brought in four new executives. You're like, man, they must be making money hand over fit, you know. And you you read these things, you see these things, especially when it comes to your competitors, especially when it comes to you know people you started companies at the same time, and you're like. And you, you, you really go through all the time measuring. You're like, wait a minute. They started and they're doing this and they're doing that. 
and that for me, when I got with some of these founders behind the scenes, and I'm like, hey, you looks like you're crushing it. They're like, it has been the worst year, you know, and and you see that so often. And I want to share that because I think so many people, if you don't have the network, if you're not spending time with other people, and by the way, this is not just for founders. This is for anyone who works in startups. Like when you look, you're like, our competitor's crushing it. Do you see all these features that they're releasing? And then you talk to someone who's interviewing from that competitor, like, oh, those features don't even work. Like they're just like, you know, and and I had a person I never I'll never forget this. She, she came in, she was a marketing person, and I was like, man, your company is amazing. Gartner Magic Quadrant. She's like, oh, we fully mocked up the entire product, made up in wireframes, and clicked through it, but it doesn't actually exist. And she's <laughs> like, you know, and you like hear that, and you're like, wow, like there's so much weird stuff happening, you know, that you don't even think about. And so I think that's important to remember, especially, especially at times like now where it is hard, it is very difficult right now to be uh, uh, a technology company, a venture-backed technology company. It is a very, very hard time right now. And it is not just a hard time for people who are having a hard time in here. It is basically a hard time for most companies in one way or another, you know? And, and I think that it will continue to be not just because of the macro market dynamics, but building a company is hard. We had, a, we had an advisor who was the former CFO of Atlassian. His name is Alex Estevez, and he changed my career, changed the company's trajectory. And he said to me, even in Atlassian, Atlassian, no salespeople, no this, billions of in revenue, blah, blah, blah. Always they were going either in, they were coming out of a storm or they were going into a storm at all times. And that's important to remember, right? And, and some people are like, oh, well, that company's great. I, I say this all the time. That they didn't raise any money. They're profitable. They're bootstrapped. And the person's like, I have no one on my team to do anything. Like, I, I'm bootstrapped, but I haven't paid myself in five years. And then you have the venture back. You're like, oh, they raised $500 million. And then you realize they raised it at a valuation that they're never going to get to. And they're stressing out about it. So it doesn't matter. Like, it is, a, it is common. And I think it is important for everyone to understand that and to, to know that so that you're not thinking all the time that everyone else is crushing it, but you're not. It, it, it's, I, I think that that helps you think about things in a different Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Yes, we are all on this journey. Um, so thank you so much for that. Okay, I'll take some questions. Yes, in the back. Hi. Um, so your first point about sales, which I think is absolutely crucial, especially for early, early stage, nothing more important than sales. I wanted to clarify, are you talking about the entire sales funnel being on the founder? Or are you talking more about the bottom? And then at what point are you outsourcing or thinking about lead gen and getting someone in for lead gen? If, if you can, it, the bottom of the funnel is what I'm talking. So the question is, are you talking about the whole funnel or the bottom of the funnel? The bottom of the funnel, if you can do that. Some people can't afford to get the people to fill the top of the funnel or don't know how. But yes, it's the actual closing motion. Like, how do you get that person to have that conversation, figure out what resonates, get them over the line, figure out how the contracts work. So it's really the bottom of the funnel that matters the most. I think early stage, you have to do the top of the funnel too because you don't know, you know, there's no marketing person or anything like that. But I think it's the bottom that's the most critical piece that I'm talking about. Um, so, thank you. Um, so, I wanted to hear a little bit more about like the founding of the company, specifically around like how you came up with the idea. Was there like a kind of a trend that you saw, a tailwind, or maybe there was like some you know people talk about founding companies or businesses being like secrets. Um, was there something that you realized uh, that kind of led you to do it, or was this kind of just pure iteration? where you stumbled upon it. So one of the things that I've learned is that I'm definitely not like the inventor type. I'm not thinking about different ideas all the time. And I was working at this consulting company called Cloud Sherpas, which was one of the first ever cloud consulting companies in the world. It was actually Google's first cloud partner. This is back in 2010. And what we saw there was as we were migrating people to Google Apps at that time, um, all the IT people were telling us, my end users love using Gmail, they love using Drive, but I have none of the administrative controls that I had in Exchange, in Lotus Notes, in whatever tool that they, group-wise, in all the tools that they were using. And so we at the consulting company were building custom apps to solve those problems. So actually what I saw is, hey, this is not going to be a big business inside of a consulting company. It's, I don't think I've ever seen a consulting company that able to build a product business. And so that was where I got the idea. So it wasn't really anything genius. It was, I was living it, seeing it with these customers and saying, 
there's a whole product business that can exist around this, very similar to how Quest or back in the HP OpenView or any of these things that existed around the Microsoft stack. I, th I thought my belief at the time was that's going to exist around the Google stack, and that was how I came up with the idea. So it wasn't genius. It was more from the experience that I was having at that company. So obviously, Better Cloud has been tremendously successful, and you've made a lot of really good decisions. Maybe some things broke your way. You got a bit of tailwind from luck. Um, is there one thing that you look back at and wish you'd done differently? Um, very honestly, the things that I look back on, and I've been doing a lot of reflecting recently, actually, um, so I, this is top of mind. If, if I'm being really bluntly honest, it's um, there were a couple of bad hires that I made um, that definitely... I should have known that I was making. And uh, when I reflect, and, and they set us back m maybe years in some cases. I'm not exaggerating that, um, early and late. Um, and those hires, again, back to my point, actually they've been very successful in other places, but it wasn't right for where we were. And uh, my reflection when I went through this, I actually talked to the person who ran uh, recruiting for us, and she said, Dave, it's because you were so... Um, rushed to get a person to fill the seat that you weren't really being clear eyed in who you were in who you were choosing because we had an empty seat and I had at one point 15 16 direct reports and I said I can't do this I'm gonna die. like this is this is impossible and I was like I gotta fill the seat and that those those were mistakes that really those uh, and they're hard because especially you get an executive or a key person, and it's just a long, you know, you're onboarding them, you're doing, you know, and it's, and, and it takes a long time to unwind that, um, and, and I learned my lesson, and actually, as we got towards the later, later stages, I took forever, like, six, eight months to hire executives, and I said, I am going to make sure, <laughs> like, make sure that they're the right people, but that, those, those were the ones that set us back the most. Yeah, I'll just add, there is one very tactical thing that you put in your notes, and it sounds so obvious, but until I read it, I was like, oh, this should be something that everyone takes away, which is um, that most people don't know how to interview well. And when you got to the mid-stage, you are no longer the one interviewing, right? You need to make sure you're hiring, your, your people are hiring good people. So maybe talk, touch on that really quickly, tactically. Yeah, so, so that one actually, that's an important one. I was doing it, uh, we were doing an interview for someone, and uh, I was coming out of the, or a person was coming out of the room, and I was going into the room for the interview, and I said to her, and she's maybe one of the best people at the company, been there forever, I said, high five, I'm like, yeah, how was it? She's like, I think it went well. I actually don't know what questions to ask. Like, in the, you know, she was so nervous going, you know, going into the, she was the interviewer and she was nervous because no one had ever told her what questions to ask, how to interview. She'd only been the interviewee. And so we actually did interview training for all of the people who were going to be involved in interviews to make sure that they understood how to ask those questions. And then at a conference, I think it was a Warburg conference, I believe, there was a speaker and they, they gave this one tip, which I, I'm going to share because it worked amazing. Like I, I learned from this tip, which was when talking to a candidate, you say to them, hey, um, you know, so who were you reporting to? OK, you're reporting to Amy. Great. And for the whole time. Great. OK. And um, so, listen, I'm going to call Amy, you know, to do obviously a reference check on you. And when I do, what's Amy going to say was your biggest weakness? And you, every person, I mean, think about how you would answer that question. Every single person freezes because you can't be like, well, I work too hard, <laughs> yeah. you know? And I would say, like, just let's think about your last review that you did. What was the thing that came up in your last review? And that small, like, just that small twist changed everything about the interview dynamics. And it's like, okay, so when I talk to Amy and I talk about that project that you mentioned you worked on, yeah. what was the result that you... And it is amazing. It really, that thing, when he said that, I'll never forget when he said that to everyone, and it was all CEOs. Everyone's like writing it, like, that's a good one. And that small thing has made a really big difference, actually, in my interviewing, because I am going to do reference checks, of course, especially if it's an executive. Um, and so for me, it was, it was a really important thing of, you know, making sure that you're really getting to the, to the honest truth quickly. Yeah. All right, two more. Yes, yes sir. Uh, my name is Paul. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How did you 
I'm curious because you were selling the businesses, you were selling the particular type, types of people in that business, and I'm sure they had their habits. How did you balance between what they were, what their practices were, and their habits were, versus maybe trying to see certain best practices in the industry? For example, you know, these people do things a certain way because they've done it that way for 10 years, but in a different industry, maybe they're doing things a little bit differently, or how did you? sort of try to keep a balance between what people are doing today with your product and where you think, where you believe they should be going and, and balancing your product with that. How, did you ever come across that sort of issue? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I think Jessica mentioned it earlier. Like we definitely, um, not just us, I think if you talk to product managers at many companies, I was interviewing a product manager from Slack. He's like, you know what, Dave, people use like, a third of the features in Slack. It's like every time we release a new feature, no one really uses it. And like when you hear that, you know, you're like, what? Slack though? You know? And then you start looking in Slack, you realize there's all these features. Yeah. And, and no one Canvas. I, I saw that the other day. Yeah. I never saw it. And, and so, so I think that that is like a, an, that's again one of those examples of that's happening everywhere on every single product. And you build it and you're like, they're going to use it. This is going to change their lives. And they're like, no, I really like to just do the spreadsheet and upload it. And I'm like, no, but this will automate all of that. No, no, this is just like our process that we do. It's in a calendar invite, and then it sends an email, and then I do this. I'm like, no, no, this automates it all, you know? And, and I think that that's, a, that's just challenging to get over. Well, the way we did it is we invested a lot in thought leadership and a lot in creating the best practices. And it took many, many, many years. But actually what I did is I, I met with hundreds of IT people, and I'm, I've never been an IT person. I met with hundreds of them and I just regurgitated back to the market what they told me kind of as best practices and then we tried to create that as the best practice but it is an uphill battle to change people's behavior you know that's a hard that's a hard thing to do hard, yeah. all right we'll take yes, yes. So, yeah. so you mentioned a couple of times that you had made some selection errors when hiring people I know that could be tricky right because roll to roll it's different but do you have a benchmark or like maybe your rule of thumb of understanding when somebody has shown you that they're not a good fit for your organization at this time? Um, that's a good question. I think that what I probably did wrong in the beginning, um, or not in the beginning, but let's say earlier in my career generally, is I basically felt like my job was to pitch every person on how amazing the job was and the company was and I was and and like I was pitching like as if I was pitching a customer and what I started to learn is actually I'm going to try to almost pitch against joining the company to tell them all the hardest things about the job and I started doing that a lot like and and actually for us one of the things that we're known for better cloud is known for is essentially our customer support is like a Zappos level support but for IT and what happened is we were hiring people and they were coming from other jobs, support jobs. And they were like, yeah, okay, it's a support job, whatever. I'm like, and that was partially my mistake. Then I started interviewing people. I'm like, okay, our support team has four chats open at the same time. Average response time is nine seconds. You know, 99% satisfaction score. So if you don't get 99%, it's not good. And we started doing the opposite. And then you start seeing that the people are like, oh, I'll, I'll do that. Like, I'm... It, it kind of weeds out a lot of those people. And it was the same for executives. Like, hey, this is not a job. I started learning to tell people, like, this is not a job where you are you have a huge team and you're in an ivory tower. And then you're going to be actually the best executives at this company can get all the way down in the weeds and go all the way up to a board meeting. And, like, those are the most successful people. That's what you're going to be expected to do. And the right people are going to respond the right way to that. But I've, I found that that actually is an interesting – some people don't like that tactic – I actually think that that's the right thing to do. And then when the person joins, there's no misun. Actually, most people would join and be like, this isn't as bad as you said. You know? <laughs> and so you're getting the right kind of person. Got to, yeah, over, uh, under promise, over deliver, right? Um, I think the one thing I'll, I'll, I want, I'm very curious about, um, and we hear this a lot actually from a lot of our founders, is they generally will come to me and say, I'm not sure if this person's going to work out. And I'm kind of like, honestly, if you're saying that to me, like, chances are you're probably right, right? And so I think founders oftentimes are like, I don't know if I should listen to my gut on that, right? Like, I should pip them, I should give them a chance, like maybe talk just very briefly on that. And I'll take one last question, so think of a good one. I think, I think that 90% of the 
time, your gut is right on that. And when you know, you know, you know. And and for me, the, the thing that I've noticed in my career is when people can't really see around the corners, when people can't really understand what to do next, when people, that starts to be that period of time where you realize, okay, there's, there's you know, or culturally something starts to be a disconnect. Um, and so I, I think most founders, forget founders, I think most managers that you talk to will say, Usually, I should have had that conversation. I should have separated from that person faster than I did. I, I don't. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with someone where they say, "You know what? I should have taken longer." You know, no one really says that. And and um, I think that that's a really um, that that's really like we said. It is a hard thing to do. One of the things that I learned actually, you know, from from Vista, who's been an amazing partner. They came in 18 months ago, and and we started working with them. They've been an amazing partner. One of the big things for them is succession planning, but being very upfront about succession planning all the time. That was a really hard thing for me to get comfortable with. To go to someone and be like, "You've been here for eight years. Do you want to be here forever?" It doesn't feel, you know. And having that conversation. But you know what? A lot of people are like, "You know what, Dave? I was thinking two more years because at that point we'll get to this stage, and you know, then." And it's amazing when you start having those conversations with people, like in a very open way. People actually start to to respond and you start to understand the dynamics and you're like, oh, well, if I'm gonna replace that person, I better start getting the person underneath them ready right. for yeah. that role. And and that was a, that's later stage, right. but I think the succession plan, that was a huge, in the last 12 months, 18 months, that's been like a huge learning for yeah, me. Yeah, sometimes just asking the person. <laughs> okay, last question. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Eric, I'm a pre-seed founder uh, and our advisors keep telling us the shit doesn't go, go away when we reach seed series A, it gets harder. Um, so I was wondering, like, how much harder does it get, and at what point does it get, like, does it plateau? How much harder does it get? This is a great, great last question. I, I think that it um, it stays as hard as it is uh, for you now, except for <laughs> the problems become different. And, and um, you know, there was someone who actually was an investor, uh, Dave Acheria, who became the, the MongoDB CEO and amazing leader. And he was an investor before. And I was talking to him about a round years ago. And he said, do you want to build a big company? I said, yep, I, I definitely do. I'm ready for that. And he said, are you good at, do you enjoy and are you good at people, like in general? I said, I think I'm pretty good at it. He's like, that's going to be that's going to be it. Like, that's your job is the people. And so it, when you get bigger, and that's what I learned as we got into the hundreds of employees, you start realizing the job. So it may not be as hard in the technical getting the product over the line, but now if you're the CEO or the CTO and you have 400 people reporting to, now you have a people problem that you is just constant, you know, and you're always dealing with that. And then after that, then you have an investor problem because you've been around for 20 years and this investor wants liquidity and this, you know, you you it's it's a constant. Um, there the challenges don't really stop; they just I think change in terms of what what they are. But like I said before, even the biggest companies, they're in and out of storms kind of the whole way through. And, um, you know, you have to, I tell people, you got to enjoy the journey and you have to learn from it. That's how I think about it. It's like, you got to just enjoy and look back once in a while and go, oh my God, how much did I, how much, how far have we actually already come? How much have we learned already? And that's, that's a big part of, if you're not going to do that, you can't, like, this is just too, too much like this you, you got to be able to look back and say man I, I did that I did that you know yeah. awesome well I cannot thank you enough David for this incredible incredible session can I get a huge tremendous round of applause um I do and we haven't actually talked about it is this Google Doc that you put together which is incredible I mean it is truly like the hard thing about hard things but I will say I think when I when I talk to David I'm sure a lot of you feel this way just like the warmth and joy that you bring to it. I just think the fact that you're always so positive, you always find um, the you know better silver lining. I just, I, I, I can't thank you enough. And thank you for inspiring. Thank you for encouraging a whole new generation of founders. And thank you for everything that you've done for our New York City community. We, we really can't thank you enough. Huge rounds of applause. Um, and so with that, we're gonna um, open up for more networking. I'm sure you'll get a lot of folks coming up for more questions. Um, and this is our last in-person meetup of the year. We will be back in 2024. So be on the lookout for more. But thank you so much again, David.